librarian and you are sitting in the map collection. Raise your hand if you've never been in this space before. Excellent. Mm -hmm. See, that's one of the reasons we do this. Uh, <laughs> because how many of you had a hell of a time finding it? <laughs> yeah, right. So this is the map collection. We have um, uh, somewhere between 70,000 and 100,000 maps. And uh, we have now gotten, I have found out recently, 20,000 of them into the c online catalog. Yay! We're working on that. I uh, had no idea we'd gotten that high. And uh, you are um, welcome to come here. We're open 11 to 3, Monday through Friday. We can also be open by appointment. And uh, maps, uh, you're welcome to come take a look at them if you have any map questions. And I want to thank um, people who actually did the work, not me. Uh, that's Dennis. Dennis Matthews is the manager, and uh, he's the one who supervised all this stuff and got it all set up and ordered the cookies, the important stuff. And I want to thank uh, his uh, student assistants, Evan and Jordan and Rachel. Are they here? Hi there. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, can't imagine it's going to happen, but I'm supposed to tell you. In an emergency, there's an entrance. Yeah, I feel like it. In an emergency, there's an ed exit there. There's another exit right over there behind those uh, globes hanging on the wall, the purple door. Go through that door, turn left, and you go out to the street. Okay? Um, I can't imagine what kind of emergency would happen. But. Uh, okay. Uh, if you want to sign up to hear about future events like this, there's a sign up sheet right out in the hallway. You can catch it on the way out. Feel free. And we'd be happy to do that. What have we got here? I haven't talked about that. This is a map collection. I said it's got a bunch of maps in it. We've got um, Canadian topographic maps, <coughs> United States topographic maps. We have the main map collection. We have nautical maps. We have um, <coughs> these things, which are relief maps. Three dimensional. Yeah, he's fired. <laughs> we have globes. Uh, and we have the main collection, which has maps from every part of the world. The closer you get to Bellingham, the more maps you're going to find. But we have maps from everywhere. What have I missed, Dennis? Okay, good. Um, I always like to point out that uh, sometimes people are inspired after one of these wonderful talks to uh, make a donation. Uh, always welcome. <coughs> uh, we'll be used to, to buy maps and related stuff. What is the Speaking of Maps program? It is a program once each quarter, except over the summer, we have someone, typically a professor from the university, come speak about something related to maps and their research on it. It's always fascinating. Last one was Ed Matthew? Matthew, talking about uh, maps um, as a lens on Nazism, the growth of Nazism, which is just amazing. Uh, so, let's see. See if I, no, I haven't missed anything. Okay, I want to thank the co-sponsors for today's events, uh, which includes Western Libraries, the Border Policy Research Institute, and Huxley Spatial Institute. Smile at Stephen, who's from Huxley Spatial Institute. And now I am pleased to introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, Aquila? Yes! Yeah! A plus! <laughs> Flower is an assistant professor of geography at Western where she teaches physical geography and GIS. She has a PhD in geography from the University of Oregon, and her research focuses on the complex interactive effects of climate variability, human land patterns, and natural disturbances on forest ecosystems. And one thing I forgot to say, I have to say, um, you'll notice they're filming this, and in a few weeks, it will be available on the Western Institutional Repository, which essentially is a place where we store information um, from faculty members mostly and staff, uh, articles, and, and in this case, a video. Uh, most of the speeches of the Speaking of Maps series have been recorded there and are available. You can watch them anytime, but you have to supply your own brands. Okay? Um, it's called <coughs> Western Cedar. I, I didn't say that. No. <laughs> That's why I jumped Western in. Cedar, which is Western the institutional Cedar. repository. Thank yep. you, Kim. Yep. She knows much more about it than I do. And uh, now I'll shut up and let Aquila do it. Thank you, Rob. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so 
I'm Aquila. I am holding this microphone thing because I didn't know that I needed to wear a belt or a pocket, so I'm just going to wave it around. Um, so as you heard, I'm a um, professor of geography, and I teach uh, GIS classes, uh, well, a bunch of them, and run a GIS certificate and minor program. So if you leave this talk feeling like maps are pretty interesting and you want to learn how to make them, come talk to me or that guy Stefan over there um, about our classes where you can learn how to create your own geospatial data. Okay, and you heard my research interests, which have nothing to do with my talk today. <laughs> this is a little bit of a tangent, something else. Uh, but it does have to do with the big, complicated spatial processes that happen across Earth's surface. That's what geographers like to look at. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, so let's dive in. I, I started with this image. Um, academic fair use again. Uh, a screen capture from Google Earth. And I just like thinking about this sort of image with the world kind of tilted, not with north at the top. Can you all recognize where we are? All right, we're just looking at Washington, British Columbia coast. We're so used to seeing the world laid out in the same way all the time with international borders drawn across like they're a real part of the physical world, right? And some people might feel maybe a little confused or disappointed when they first go up to the Canadian border and don't see a big line across the ground. Um, so I'm going to talk about a digital atlas of the Pacific Northwest. I'll explain what I mean by Pacific Northwest. And the big goal behind this is getting data sets that go across that border smoothly and seamlessly because there isn't really that solid line there. I mean, you can actually see it some places where they clear the trees, but for the most part, it's not there. Um, the world is more complicated than just the US and Canada. OK, uh, before I start, I have to thank uh, my collaborators, because this is a big group project. We've been working on it gradually for most of this school year. Nabil Kamel is my co-PI <coughs> on this, this project. Um, he's a professor of more planning and geography combined in the Environmental Studies Department with me. Gus Landefeld, Danny Ashley, Callie Sierra, Catherine Laurie, and Henry are all student research assistants who've really done a lot of the work that went into this project. Um, so they're the ones you should really thank for all this. But blame me for any presentation mistakes. OK, um, so let's see. Atlas, normally you think about an atlas as, as a paper product. And I adore my paper atlases. But uh, the world is moving towards more and more digital maps and digital atlases, data sets where we can update things and people can access it remotely and don't need to buy uh, a, uh, an expensive book. So everything I'm going to show you is going to be data that will be available online. Somebody could make it into a paper atlas, but we're thinking digital online geospatial data in this case. And we're thinking specifically the Pacific Northwest region. And why this is so important, coming up with this idea of these cohesive data sets, this atlas that goes across the border, is because we so often see the world uh, clipped <laughs> to international borders. So I uh, apologies for quick rough cartography, but um, I think this kind of looks like what the US looks like to a lot of people. I've, I've heard stories about people being confused about like, where is this ocean when you get to the southern border of Arizona and New Mexico, right? Because you so often see maps, you know, in elementary school of the US just clipped out. I mean, never mind, there's no Alaska and Hawaii here. Uh, but there's this mysterious world to the south, this great southwestern ocean, and this big old, I don't know, Sea of Canada. There's like maple syrup and igloos or something up there, and you don't know what's up there. <coughs> you don't see the data, you just ignore it. You deal with the data for your country all the time. And that means you don't have geographic context for anything you're researching or studying. Um, so I want to kind of fill in, replace these sea monsters, specifically up in this border in this corner to start with, with what's up there. Because it's not actually the edge of the world, right? Um, this is particularly important for us since we live on the border, right? And a lot of the time you'll go out and you'll find a map of Whatcom County and it's just like an island floating in empty space. The students in my classes know I can't stand it when things look like islands with empty space around it. Because well, what about all the stuff around there that's affecting what's going on in Whatcom County? You have no sense of that, no real sense of geography or location. Apologies to whoever made the maps that I'm showing. These are from a Google image search. I didn't really think about it being recorded. I hope it doesn't hurt my ceilings. Um, there's another one. Just. Uh, this little dagger, Whatcom County just cut out there with no context. And the award for the most amazing cartography of all time. <laughs> um, this map over here with actually blue. I didn't edit that. The ocean just 
continues. Um, some pretty fabulous label placement, too. OK, so this was on the first page of Google Images searches. I didn't have to look hard to find an example of this. Obviously, this does not reflect the world we really live in. People are crossing the border. Money and goods are crossing the border. Animals are crossing the border. Wind dispersed seeds are crossing the border, right? And um, we are affected by processes, by phenomena that exist on the other side of that mysterious ocean. And the orcas out here don't know about the border. I do a lot of forest ecology work. Wildfires and insect outbreaks don't know about this border, right? So I'm making this case we need to think about what's actually out there instead of just what's easy to find data when we're making maps or when we're doing any sort of analysis. It doesn't make sense to think about Whatcom County in isolation. You're really not getting the whole picture if you do that. So uh, to state that, again, uh, the problem that I am addressing, starting to address with this project <coughs> is, is about ugly maps, yes, but also just the fact that those ugly maps don't exist simply out of laziness, they exist because it's hard to find good data sets that go across the border. If you go out and look for data sets on the same subject, you'll find they often don't match up very well at the border. So I went and grabbed just more Google image searches, some maps of streams. <coughs> this has been kind of popular lately, making maps where you show countries just by the stream network without a border. US, Canada streams. Canada's a little cut off down there, but you can still see, say, looking over in the BC border, they don't line up at the border. This one's tilted. That has to do with its map projection. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. You could fix that, but even if you fix that, you're still seeing a different scale of rivers in these two, right? You probably have a different definition of what a river is in these two data sets. How big does it need to be? Does it need to be a perennial stream? You can have water all year. Can you have a seasonal intermittent stream to count it? Those are different definitions of what we're mapping. When you look for this, you just find rivers, as if that's one thing. But rivers right, are kind of a, a human construction. There are lots of different features that contain water. We're defining something as river, and we might do it differently for two different data sets. Once we get into the details of the rivers, we might describe different variables about the rivers. We might describe discharge rate. We might describe temperature, and we might describe those in different units. Are we looking Celsius, Fahrenheit for temperature, right? We might also have collected the data in different years. Streams change a lot. The banks of the streams will move around. Streams are very dynamic features. So if we're comparing your data from 1990, I don't actually know what year this was from, and 2010, those might not really <coughs> match up. So that's the, the challenge when you go out and you want to get a more complete, cohesive picture of the world, not as an island of the US or Whatcom County. The data don't necessarily line up. This is a big problem for me with my forest ecology work, where wildfire severity is described and defined differently in Canada and the US in some of these data sets. The insect outbreaks I study in the US, there's, I think, three categories of severity of insect outbreak. And in Canada, there's five. There's no way to easily make those work together, right? You can't just generalize across it. The data sets are always found in different locations, and they don't necessarily match up at the border. They don't necessarily cover the same year. So data sets, in general, just tend to not line up internationally, temporally, geographically, or conceptually. And by conceptually, I mean those ideas of what counts as a river. How do we define high severity versus a low severity fire? Those sorts of definitions when we describe what we see out there. Of course, that's not what we want. What we want is a beautiful, cohesive map that shows where rivers really are. This is obviously selected to be only big rivers, but it makes no sense, right, to think about a river ending at an international border. Obviously, water is flowing through it. We need to understand what's going on from the headwaters to the mouth of the river. And my talk is not about rivers, but it's a good example of why we need these data, because continuous phenomena like water or like people moving around in different locations don't stop at a border. So our start of a solution, and we are not solving all the world's data limitation problems, um, is this Atlas of the Pacific Northwest, which is funded by the Border Policy Research Institute and the Spatial Institute here. And the, the basic idea with this is creating what we're calling harmonized data sets. So data sets where we go in and we fix those problems with the temporal and geographical irregularities across the border. We merge them together into a single data set. 
and then release them on this web map portal so that the general public can explore the data and download the data. For our first data set, we are doing something not at all about forest ecology in my normal research, but we're looking at human demography. So here's a couple of more maps pointing out how hard it is to compare things. Just quick Google search for population data, Canada and the US. Here's people per square kilometer. There's people per square mile. Here's, uh, what do we have, four classes. Here's a whole bunch of different classes that it's broken into. 2006, I think this is 2000. Not really directly comparable. So I wanted to look at this one first, in part because we're funded by the Border Policy Research Institute, and policy cares a lot about people. But people matter for all sorts of things, right? Any sort of economic analysis, you want to know where people are. Any sort of environmental impacts associated with the density of human populations, you need to know where people are. So this is our test case for this grant for this project. We're hoping the atlas will grow eventually to contain more data sets, but we're going to start with this demography data set. And if you stick it out through my whole talk, you'll see that this demography data set represents a lot of the big challenges with dealing with this type of geographical data. So a little overview of the project before I get into the challenges and start talking about the data. And I will actually show you our results eventually, I promise. But you have to kind of follow me along through the process of how we got there first. OK. So our product, what we're actually creating to begin with and what we've been working on for months is Harmonized International Census Geospatial Data Products. Where are their people? That's what we're starting with. And that one little box there is going to take up most of my talk, talking about how we actually create that. Turns out it's not as simple as grabbing two data sets and putting them together. All of that is being hosted on Esri's cloud storage infrastructure facilities. So we don't have to run a web mapping server. We don't have to deal with storing these big data sets. Esri, which is the big leading company for GIS analysis for geospatial software, uh, has this nice interface already online where they'll store some data for you and help you make web maps kind of easily. So all our data is going up into the great cloud of the internet. And then we're releasing it through ArcGIS Online. So this is Esri's web mapping interface. We're creating customized web maps that are interactive so people can move around and explore it. We'll see what that looks like when I do my demo. And gives people data access. Or will. Nothing's released yet, but it will. Uh, we also hope to bring in additional content from other research projects. And this will be an ongoing thing. But as more research is done that deals with cross-border data sets, it can be added in here. And both our data sets and this, these additional content items can go into what are called story maps. So these are a, a set of web apps that sort of wrap your web map in an aesthetically pleasing way to make it easy to use. I'll show you some examples of it. So something more than just a place where you go and you see a bunch of different data sets online, right? Uh, places where you can kind of guide the, the reader, the user, through the stories of the data that you found. All of that is going to go up on a website, which will hopefully be up fairly soon. Um, so everyone can access all these different data sets and the web maps as well. OK. So that's the plan. We're going to talk about that orange box to begin with. And yes, it is not as simple as putting those two data sets together. You get some US census data and some Canadian census data. A lot of work goes into making them play together well. So I have a lot of big words here, which you are welcome to use at the next party you go to. Um, I'm going to not expect any technical knowledge, so don't be scared. But there are some cool phrases like the modifiable aerial unit problem. If you haven't heard about that, you've got to. Um, <laughs> and I show all these because you know we were working on the project, trying to get started, and it kind of became apparent really early on that we had to make some big decisions about basic geographical concepts, cartographical concepts, in order to make the decisions you have to make. You can't avoid making, but how to handle this, these data. So I'm going to talk about our, our geographic harmonization first. We had to do things like define the region we're going to work in. Right? You've got to start with defining that. You can't just go into it with no region defined. And I'll go through each of these in my talk today. Then temporal harmonization, conceptual harmonization, and finally our geovisualization, when we're actually turning it into cartographic products, into our maps and web maps. So our, okay, our first decision here was 
a region. And regions do not have universal definitions for the most part. People make up definitions of what a region is, right? We decided to take kind of an easy way out. Since we're working with census data, it lines up really well with political borders. So we're working with British Columbia and Washington. That's not all of the Pacific Northwest, but what is all of the Pacific Northwest? What are we missing? What's, what else is included in the Pacific Northwest in your mind? Oregon. Oregon. Anything else? Alaska. Uh, Alaska, OK. Minnesota. Uh -huh. Minnesota? Huh, OK. Would anybody else put Alaska in? The Pacific Northwest? Anybody disagree? You would, Lori would. Yeah? Right? Maybe some Idaho. Maybe Southern Idaho is really different from Northern Idaho. So my point is, it's tricky to come up with these regional definitions. Um, and so we stuck with like an easy little corner over here. But while we're calling it the Alice of the Pacific Northwest, it's not really all of the Pacific Northwest. But it's an important little corner of it. So we'll treat this as a subset of the Pacific Northwest. However you define it, your definition is probably bigger than ours. Um, it's also a subset of Cascadia. Who's heard of this idea of Cascadia? This idea of this, this region in the Northwest that has somewhat consistent uh, cultural and physical landscape characteristics, right? Similar climate and so on. We're a subset of that here. This is one map, which is cut off here, defining Cascadia. Um, so this kind of matches up with the Northwest definition. You know, we're thinking like, kind of coastal BC, Washington, most of Oregon, but oh, not that bit. Uh, some of Northern California, some Idaho, over to the Continental Divide. It's really tricky to, to define these things. So we're contributing to our knowledge of Cascadia, but only in a subregion. We also contain the Salish Sea, had to bring it back, there's Stefan's map. Um, so that's a subset of our region, which means anybody who's interested in Salish Sea sort of issues can use these data to represent that, okay? So our region, cheap way out. We went with BC and Washington. We have a little regional context there compared to the other regions that people care about in our area. Okay, once we had a region, then we had to think about geographical scale. Scale is a super basic geographical concept. Geographers are really aware that our results vary depending on the scale that we measure things at and display them at. And here I want to bring up the specific issue related to scale, MOP. The modifiable aerial unit problem, which is an awkward long sentence, but it means something that's really pretty obvious when you think about it. Your results are going to be different depending on the scale that you aggregate data at and the zones you use to aggregate it. So why do we aggregate data at all? Well, with census data, we want to protect people's privacy. We don't want to show where they actually live, right? That's going to invade their privacy. So we need to aggregate it into some sort of unit. It's also really hard to see hundreds of thousands of points on a map. So for display purposes, that's pretty tricky. So we usually put our points of people, or, or often if we're counting up butterflies or whatever we're studying, into some sort of bigger polygon, some sort of regions we define. This figure here is showing an example of how our MOP might pl play out. These yellow points, think of them representing anything, people, or butterflies, or orcas, whatever we want, and we have one example up here where we've just divided the whole study area into an even grid. And we just count up the number of points in each of those squares. The color of the square represents how many points are in that square. Then we could do that again with instead of an even grid, we could draw some uneven polygons. Maybe we have a good reason for that, maybe they're watersheds or something. We get a really different looking pattern. When you look at that, you're like, oh, there's this one area that has the high count, right? Well, now here we have two areas. These different polygons in the last option here, don't show any area with a really high density of points. So how we aggregate our data matters a lot. This has tangent time, but this has big political implications in the form of gerrymandering, which you may have heard about this idea that you can draw our voting district boundaries in a way that might favor one party or another. This is an example of MOP, the number of votes in your aggregation area, in this case, a voting district, is going to change depending on how you draw those districts. Yeah. So what do we do about this? Well, there's no real total solution because MOP is always going to exist. The scale that we aggregate data at and the zones we aggregate them over are always going to have an impact on our data. But we need to be aware of that and transparent about it. Obviously, with gerrymandering, we need to have compact, fair distribution 
as much as we can. It's hard to define exactly what that is, but you can use some math and try to do it. In our case, not about gerrymandering, um, we needed to find comparable geographic aggregation units. So what are the areas we're going to count up people in? And of course, Canada and the US don't use the same language. You're going to notice a theme throughout. They didn't set this up to make it easy for us. Um, so we decided to use counties in the US to start with, kind of coarse scale. And then in, in Canada and BC, they don't have the same equivalent thing. Uh, but we decided to use what we call census districts. So we're trying to come up with roughly equivalent geographical areas so we can overcome a little bit of MOP. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but a little bit. Um, counties, just some long definitions, but counties is a subdivision of a state, which may include municipalities. Census division, their definition on Stats Canada, intermediate geographic areas between the province level and the municipality. So they're both smaller than the state or province and bigger than a municipality, that kind of coarse scale area. So that's what we're going to use. Do be aware though, MOP still exists. If we looked at census block groups, finer scale polygons, we might see slightly different results. Okay, so there's scale. Um, we're looking at uh, 39 counties and 29 census divisions. And we're looking at them for BC and Washington. That's our region. Um, so we've got, we've got to start here, right? We know what we're going to do. Um, now we have to look at some seemingly really obvious questions about the things we're studying in their location and find out that they're not as obvious as it seemed. First one, where's the border? Well, turns out if you go and download census data from the US and Canada, they don't really seem to know. This kind of surprised me a little bit. I thought maybe international territory mattered a lot. Turns out the census data sets are not the location for conveying reliable international boundaries. Uh, here's two different examples. Here we are out sort of um, off the coast of Vancouver Island here, um, looking into Washington here. And we have no man's land in here, just unclaimed territory apparently, set up a colony, I don't know. No, don't make any, don't make any decisions based on this. <laughs> this is messy data. And we've got some overlap, on some overlap down there. Uh, poor northern interior Washington. Nobody wants that area, I don't know, they just um, left a bunch of it unclaimed. We've got some overlap in other areas along that border. So this was a mess. First thing we had to do was get things to line up. Obviously, if we're studying things cross-border, we've got to know where the border is. To do that, we needed to have a really accurate, really precise idea of where things are, right? We can't mess around and have sloppy locations. So time for another tangent. The first thing we had to do was think about the right map projection to use. Apologies to those of you who've taken GIS classes, but for those of you who haven't, maybe haven't heard me rant on about map projections a lot, uh, here's the deal with them. The world is not flat, right? The world is, well, it's actually a geoid, but it's basically spherical. And if you want to take that spherical world and spread it out onto a flat surface, you are going to introduce some distortion. Just like if you peel an orange or an apple and you try to lay that peel out flat, you're going to have gaps in between the different pieces. You can't make it lay perfectly flat and be a continuous surface. So in the process of going from that round world, from a globe to a flat map, we always add these distortions of some sort or another. Big trade-off is between how true the shape is and how true the area is of our different objects on the map. There are other things that can be distorted as well, but those are usually the ones we care about. So you might think right now, well, that's just stupid. Why would you use a flat map? But I remind you, think about using a globe that's big enough that you could see the streets in Bellingham. Mm -hmm. It would be difficult to carry around with you. Um, so <laughs> we, ha we have to do this. We have to come up with the right mathematical transformations to go from a round world to a flat world. But it's always going to introduce distortion. There's no way around that. Instead of getting around it, what we have to do is choose the right type of projection for a different purpose. We have to think carefully, do we care more about shape or area? I'm going to show a fun little clip here, um, demonstrating why that distortion always exists. I can't bring myself to do such a destructive demonstration in purpose, so I will let this video do it for me. If I want to turn this globe into a 
into a flat map. I'm gonna have to cut it open. In order to get this globe to look anything close to a rectangle lying flat, I've had to cut it in several places. I've had to stretch it so that the countries are starting to look all wonky. And even still, it's almost impossible to get it to lay flat. And that right there is the eternal dilemma of map makers. The surface of a sphere cannot be represented as a plane without some form of distortion. That was mathematically proved by this guy a long time ago. Since around the 1500s, mathematicians have set about creating algorithms that would translate the globe into something flat. And to do this, they use a process called projection. Popular rectangular maps use a cylindrical projection. Imagine putting a theoretical cylinder over the globe and projecting each of the points of the sphere onto the cylinder surface. Unroll the cylinder and you have a flat rectangular map. Wait. Okay, so that's the basic idea with projections. You don't always do it with a cylinder. There's lots of different ways to do it. And in fact, it's being done on computers, not with an actual piece of paper today. But you're always introducing that distortion. And to give you a sense of the scale of that, show one of my favorite little illustrations here through my animations, um, which is this diagram here showing the true size of Africa on the Mercator projection type map that we all grow up seeing in elementary schools these days, or throughout a lot of US history. Um, Africa looks kind of smaller than Greenland, right? It's just this tiny little continent, like what's the big deal? Who cares about this little continent over there, right? Turns out, you know, it's got 54 actual countries in it, and it's big enough that it could contain China and the United States and all of Eastern Europe and India and Japan and the UK, Germany, France, Spain, and Belgium and Netherlands and Switzerland for the heck of it as well. Um, we don't see that on a Mercator projection map, right? Uh, the projections that we are used to seeing, the maps we're used to seeing, preserve uh, shape really well, but they do not preserve area very well. One more awkward switch back here. My favorite little projections game here. Uh, this is a Mercator type projection, so a shape preserving but area distorting projection. That's what you always see on Google Maps. And somebody made this game where you take out little countries and you can move them around and see how their area is distorted as they move to different latitudes. With this particular type of projection, the distortion is the least at the equator. So let's take India over here and go down to the equator where our area is the most true. And we'll just move it up to higher latitudes. Mm and see how giant, giant it becomes, right? And that's why Greenland looks about the size of Africa, when in fact Africa is much larger than Greenland. Yeah, we don't even look at Antarctica and like, whoa! <laughs> um, so, big scale distortions. That doesn't mean a projection like this is useless, though. It's good for preserving shape, just not good for area. So kind of like with the modifiable aerial unit problem, a lot of these, these compromises we have to make with map making, they really require transparency and awareness of the distortion that's added. There's no way around it. We just need to be aware of it and talk about it and realize that our perception of something like the importance of Africa as one of the major continents might be distorted if we're always seeing maps that make it look small. Our idea about the importance of Canada might be distorted if it's always left off of our maps, right? We're just not seeing it and feeling familiar with it. Okay. So, back to what I'm actually talking about, now that I've told you about projections. Um, the actual punchline of that is just that we needed to use a projection that was good for our purposes, which was to preserve shape. We wanted to think really carefully about the shape of the border to correct those errors. So we converted to a shape preserving projection, which means area was not perfect, but we could draw a nice straight line across the 49th parallel and just fix that border up there. We used a secondary data set of international borders, so I recommend you don't use this to solve any border disputes or anything in your life, but it's close to what it should be. And then we had to go in and manually edit those lines, redraw them to fix this. Okay, so a lot of thought went into, in the end, a somewhat simple process of redrawing. Next super obvious question. We've figured out where the border is. Well, these are coastal province and state. Where's the coastline? And I, I want to bring up here a neat geographical concept paradox, the coastline paradox. This idea that you basically can't really know where the coast is. 
because the scale that you map a coastline at is going to affect the length of the coastline and the look of the coastline hugely. Coastline length can get really close to infinity. If you map the coastline at a tiny enough scale, if you're out there mapping every single centimeter of every single curve of every rock along the coastline, you have a really long coastline. If you just draw a big course line generalizing along the coast, you get a much shorter coastline. So I bring this out because it points out how tricky coasts are. Coastlines change all the time. They're active dynamic areas, just like I was talking about with rivers. So they're changing over time. We don't really know how long they are because that depends on how we measure them. And different legal bodies have different definitions of what the coastline is. Coastline definition for uh, determining who has rights to the natural resource extraction in an area, very different from coastline definitions used to decide where we're supposed to do restoration projects in Puget Sound or something like that. So coastline paradox at play. Um, let me show you some actual examples of how tricky it is to come up with the right coastline. These are sort of our, our best data sets that we came up with for BC and Washington coastlines. They don't look too bad. They kind of look like they match up in there. Let's zoom in a little bit. Point Roberts is my test case. Um, you'll see. Okay, looks okay. Zoom in a little bit more. Nope, not doing so well anymore. We've got overlap. We've got gaps. They don't line up along the coast. Clearly, these were not drawn by the same person tracing the same coastline. Uh, we see this problem a lot between different data sets, and we spent a good bit of time looking through different options. This figure here, and I'm sorry for the overlap over there, but this figure shows four different data sets we considered for coastline definitions. So over here, we're, we're on Vancouver Island here, the Saanich Peninsula. Purple in the background represents one data set. On top of that is this light green data set. So mostly they match up, but like how far does the inlet go inland? Very different in the two different data sets. Here's two different data sets for Washington. These were all downloaded from government websites. So this is like uh, Statistics Canada and Statistics BC, different definitions. Over here we have US Census and uh, Department of Natural Resources for Washington. Red outline shows one data set, much more detailed than this yellow data set in the background, which shows um, the census data's definition. So where are those islands? What is their shape? That became this metaphysical, epistemological sort of quest for us for a while. And I am proud and ashamed to say we basically gave up and said, we just can't do it. There's no consistent high resolution coastline definition available. And when we get our best data sets together and we compare it with satellite imagery, here's Point Roberts again, See, that land is not included. This land is not, it's just still, it's not good enough. It's not high enough resolution for what we need. We don't want to leave somebody who lives on an island off. We don't want to deny that coastlines change. Okay, so what we ended up doing was not defining the coastline. We're just using census definitions that extend into the ocean. So like this, this is transparent over, you can hopefully see the islands in the background. This is what you actually get from the census. They're census division or county definitions go into the water. It looks a, a little funny because it's not the exact coastline we're used to seeing, but it doesn't enforce some specific legal definition of the coastline onto the data set. So that was a long story that ended up with us not doing anything about defining the coast, but that was an important process for us to go through and realize just how lacking our coastal data sets can be when there's no consistent coastline. Okay, Whew. coastlines. What a paradox, what a challenge. Um, we quit. <laughs> okay, so now we had a consistent data set at this point. We fixed the border, we've decided on our coastal legal definition. Users in the future can just apply whatever coastline they want to it. Um, now we're ready to start adding data. But that went perhaps even, yes, more slowly than the geography thing. Our first problem, when we went into our Canadian data, well, let me go back here. This is the definition from the 2011 Canadian census. So that's what we started with, to make decisions about where we were gonna work. Then we wanted to add some years from before. We wanted to get data from 2000. Well, we go back, we find that Canada remapped its census divisions around 2006. They basically redrew all of British Columbia. So we ended up with these weird mismatches when we overlaid the data sets from 2006 and 2011 
Here we have in gray the 2011 census divisions from Statistics BC. And on top is orange, the 2006 definitions from Statistics BC. This is clearly not legal redistricting because they didn't move the island, right? Instead, they went in and redrew it. They redigitized it. Um, they have a new map. And these offsets were everywhere across BC. All the little borders would be slightly different. There's no legal documentation of a change in the district. This is just redrawing the map, which means you can't go in and compare the data sets, right? You can't say, oh, how many people lived here in 2011? How many people lived there in 2006? Let's look at the change. Can't do that if the, if the polygons don't match up, right? So that's problem number one, remapping census divisions. Problem number two, they actually did change the district definitions for some areas around 2006 as well. Um, Here's an example of that. Northern British Columbia, um, in between 2006 and 2011, this area in here switched from this region in the north to the region in the south. So we can't look at those data easily and, and understand who lives there in both years and compare them. So to get around both of these two problems, we used the 2011 geometry, those polygons, for everything. And we used a combination of aerial interpolation and desymmetric mapping, which I'm going to define in a second, um, to re redistribute the people, right, the numbers of the people through those polygons. So we would have consistent data sets that we could just stack up over the years and be able to compare really easily. Quick little definitions of what we did there. Aerial interpolation is kind of the, the simple approach to what do you do when you want to move a count in between different polygons. Imagine we have these four squares with 100, 200 people in them. And we decide, you know what, we really want to split these squares on the right in two. We've got this new data set with these purple polygons. We want to know in this area where the purple and the yellow polygon overlap, how many people live there. To do that, we've got to do a little bit of math. It's simple, but we've got to do it. Um, you know, how many people are there? So the easiest way to do that, which we did do, simple approach, is just say, well, this is 50% of the area of that big yellow square. So we're going to say 50% of the people live there. This assumes an even distribution of people, and that's a big assumption in some of these rural areas. But without additional information, that's really all we know. That's all we can do. So we just figure out what's the proportion of the original area, and say that percent of the people, or whatever we're counting, are in the new polygon. So this is the, the answer we would get over here. We just split those 200 people into two polygons here, and split these 100 people into two polygons there. So that's aerial interpolation in one slide. To get a little bit fancier, you can bring in some desymmetric mapping. <clears throat> so this is where you use knowledge of what the land use or the land cover actually is to refine your estimates of where people live. We did a really simple approach to this, I will admit, where we just said, you know, we're really sure there aren't a lot of people living in the lakes. And there's a lot of lakes in northern British Columbia. So we're going to remove those. We're going to make all the people live in on the land, right? Um, sorry to the houseboat people, but I don't think there's a lot of them up there. If we were fancier and we were in an area with more urban coverage, we could take this a little bit further. We could do things like say, well, more people are going to live in urban residential land than in urban industrial land. Less people are going to live in agricultural land, and even less people will live in, say, a national forest. So you can take your knowledge about what's on the ground there and use it to mathematically redistribute the people further. In our case, it's kind of all forest up in this area, so we, we didn't really feel like we were going to add a lot of information with the sort of data we had. So just water. Okay. So temporal projections. Summary of what we just did with this poor figure it's over on the side. There's the area we were wondering about before, this area that switched from one census division to another between years. We put it all into an equal area projection. Now we care about area more than shape, so we switched projections based on our task. Oh, thanks. Technical genius, I tell you. That was <laughs> fancy. Okay, uh, we removed all the hydrological features so people weren't allowed to live there. We figured out the area of intersections, the area that overlapped between years thought about that proportion, did our aerial interpolation, moved the people. After we'd spent a bunch of time doing this, we looked at the numbers. It's 128 people. It's a lot of work. 
for 128 people, but <laughs> we did it <laughs> the best way we could come up with, right, for those 128 people. And then we were ready to apply this process elsewhere where our census divisions had changed. Thankfully, so there were some changes on Vancouver Island so we, where there's more people, so we could feel a little bit better about what we were doing <laughs> in terms of how many people we moved per hour of work. Um, but those 128 people, yeah, so much just in the letter. Okay. So now we've got a really good spatial data set. Everything's matching up between years and across space. We're feeling pretty good about it. We had one more temporal challenge, which is just that the censuses are collected in different years in Canada and the U.S. So every 10 years in the U.S., every five years in Canada. So we had data for 2000 and 2010 for the U.S., 2001, 2006, and 2011 for Canada and the time periods we were looking at, right? Um, of course, that doesn't do us a lot of good. We want to know where people are in the same year. So we used just a simple linear interpolation approach to say, let's look at the change in population between 2011 and 2006, say, divide that by five years. See, so the average increase in people over that five-year period, we'll apply that to each year. We use that to correct our Canadian data. Living in the U.S., we were a bit U.S.-centric about this, and so we forced the Canadian data to go to the U.S. years. It's also just nice, the 2000 and 2010. Nice big even numbers. 2006 seems awkward there. I justify my U.S. centrism right there. <laughs> okay. So now we've corrected all our temporal problems and our spatial problems as best we can. Um, last thing to correct, conceptual harmonization. In this case, it wasn't as hard as it is with my wildfire and insect data. Um, we just had to think about things like age classes being defined differently. So don't get overwhelmed with the numbers here, but Canada and the U.S. use different age class definitions in the census. So like Canada gives you 18 and 19 year olds as one count. Um, the U.S. gives you 18 and 19 year olds as different counts. Canada, for some reason, cares about 22 to 24 year olds. U.S. cares about 20 to 24 year olds. You know, so. This is something we could overcome, but it was annoying at first. We rolled our eyes, really, you guys. Um, so we reclassed all of this into four categories that were a little easier to deal with. We're not erasing the underlying data. You could still download that with our data sets, but for most of our analysis and display, we're just going to think about everybody in these yellow ones as being youth. And then we have the student category, workforce category, and a senior category over there. So we just had to go through and do that to make it tidy. And now, it's harmonized. So we had to go out and visualize it. And I've got one last sort of geographical concept, mapping concept to talk about before I show you the actual maps, which is this idea of classification. You're usually going to divide your data up into some number of classes. Instead of giving every single county in Washington a different color for its exact population, it's easier to interpret it if you break it into five classes, say, or three classes, and you say you've got this range of populations that's represented by dark red. But as a warning, and you know, this is kind of my, I'll reveal my secret agenda, is for everybody to go away being a little bit more educated and critical when they look at a map. Um, this classification has a huge impact, just like projections do. These are the same data. This is total population in 2010, just for Washington County, so it fits on the screen using a uh, type of classification called equal area, where each class contains the same range of attribute values. So it's about 386,000 people per class in this case. And over here, same exact data, quantile classification, where each class contains an equal number of features. I won't test you on this later, uh, but it's like seven counties per category. And you look at that, and you get a really different sense of where people live in Washington state, right? This looks like, well, it's just n nobody's out here. Why do you care about those? This looks like it's a lot more evenly distributed. We went in and created our own manual classification system. We didn't use any kind of default things. Um, we chose to do big round numbers, so we aren't trying to add 386,000 between each class. So we've got breaks at 25,000, 75,000, and so on. But we tried to choose categories that would show something a little bit in between these two kind of extremes where we have really all the data kind of clustered into a few categories visually and all the data spread out over here. Okay, that was months. We made all those decisions. Then it was time to make some web maps. So let's look at those. Here is our actual atlas, which is still in process, uh, but should be released this summer. 
This is our first page of the Atlas of the Pacific Northwest. This is all online, interactive, will be accessible soon to the public. Uh, you can pan around the maps and zoom in to the maps. This is just the introductory page where you could go in and look at, you know, which census division am I in? You can click on anything and you can see all the data that, well, that we decided to show you. We are a little selective, so you're not overwhelmed for each of these. So here's Canada, British Columbia, Caribou um, census division in there. Where it gets interesting is when you actually get into some data. So here's our total population. All that work <laughs> went into this. Here's our total population, um, classified the way we want it, with the border fixed, with temporal harmonization done. And so you can click through. So this is, um, let's see, let's do 2,000 first. Here's 2,000 population for this census division. You can just read the totals here. We've got data for 2015, and then we have projected population counts for 2035. So you can see how it's changing over time. We have it broken down for men and women separately. And we also have counts for our different youth classes. And for each of these, we have the year 2000, 2015, and 2035. We actually have underlying data for every five years, but we figured for the web map, this is kind of enough. Um, once this is publicly released, over in the introduction tab, there'll be a set of links that will let you download the data as a CSV file you could work with in Excel or a shape file you could work with in ArcGIS. This is all going to be totally freely available, and that will have all the detailed data that we're, we're not quite showing you all of. So we've got spatial variability, we've got change over time, we've got a workforce tab that's taking a long time to load. Let's go back to students. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is a, sort of our, our big atlas. You can go in and just explore basic demographics. We also are creating a set of story maps where we're focusing on one specific theme that we're sort of pulling out from these data sets. So I'm just going to show you one example of them. This is one where we're looking at the percent of the total population that's made up of women. And we're looking at how that's changing over time. So we have data for 2015, and we have data for 2035. Let's zoom in a little bit here. And this is this fun little app for our story map that gives us this slider bar, where you move it to the right, you're looking at 2015 data, you move it to the left, you're pulling in that right-hand data set, the 2035 data. And the colors look a little weird compared to my computer, but hopefully you can see that as we move to 2035, it's getting darker and darker. So we see across almost all of the region, we're seeing this increase of the percent of the population made up of women interesting thing that we found. Now, the numbers aren't huge if we click on one of these. You know, here we're going from 48% women in 2015 to almost 50% um, in 2035. We do see some big changes in some of our more metropolitan regions down here. And it's pretty interesting. It's a consistent pattern. So we'll have a series of these maps to pull out any of those interesting kind of findings that we notice. These are actually pretty easy to make, and because our data will be freely available, anyone who learns how to do the story map, to, like you can go through a tutorial in an afternoon, can pull in our data and make their own versions to highlight, without creating any new data, just highlight what they think is interesting in our data sets and share that as well. Okay. Um, that, that is the plan. More story maps. We've got this whole thing. Um, our Story has been created, our ongoing development of the ArcGIS Big Atlas, and eventually the website. So just wrapping up with ongoing work. One thing I didn't talk about is that we're creating our own population projections. Those are still underway. So what I just showed you for 2035, that's from the census. We found some things that, I don't know, seemed a little suspicious to us. We thought maybe we could do this in a different, possibly better way hmm, for some areas. Uh, so we're taking uh, our current population, births and deaths, and estimates of migration, and using those all quantitatively to come up with a statistical model of what we expect future population numbers to be. That will all be available on our atlas as well as soon as it's done. And then our big goals as we wrap this project up, to create that central website that will link to the web maps and can link to other data sets that people contribute, create additional web maps to highlight things like our population projections that we're creating ourselves. Those will want to go on the atlas. 
And then to continue our data analysis and pulling out the interesting stories with specific little story maps where we can highlight those interesting findings. And then the, the big long-term idea with this, you know, our grant is going to wrap up this summer, but now Border Policy Research Institute on campus is going to have this geospatial data clearinghouse, this set of maps, this place where people can add new data potentially. So quality harmonized data sets are wanted. Uh, my vision for it would not be like a little random data set where somebody created some data over in the eastern Whatcom County and somebody created some in, in Victoria, but these beautiful big harmonized data sets. And so I hope that this will become a clearinghouse where more of those data will be added in one place so people can go and access it easily all in one location. Okay, so now wrapping up, happy to take any questions. I'm happy to look back at the map again if you want. Um, and thank you again to the Spatial Institute and Border Policy Research Institute and Western Libraries for supporting this project and this talk today. Bert. Oh, <laughs> applause first. Thank you, please. So I'm interested in the population of Salt Spring Island. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, I didn't see how we would get to that. So let's go into our Alice. You want total population? Okay, you're going to have to help me find Salt Spring Island in here. Okay, we're like up right off the coast in here? Here. Okay. So we're in. Um, Let's click on this. Here's 2035 projection. We're in the Capital Regional District. So we don't have data for that island specifically, right? That's a finer scale than the census. Canadian census actually releases data at. But for this whole area, um, this whole regional district, you could see 2035, 2015 population, and so on. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. The, uh, I think it was last fall, we Stefan had a Huxley speaker series guy come from University of Oregon talking about the Yellowstone migration mm -hmm. atlas that they're working on. And I was just wondering if you have anyone involved with your project tracking transboundary animal migrations. Um, well, no. So, so this project is just about creating the atlas and the data sets, but the the idea being that it could ho host things like that, could house things like that later on, and that is certainly a cross-border phenomenon that would be worth looking at, definitely. Right now, there's all these interesting different projects that people are doing, right? And they don't end up all in one location where you can find out about it. So you don't even know that anyone's doing it necessarily. And if people were doing that, say, for the Washington, B.C. border, and maybe there's some similar species they're looking at in Alberta and Montana or something, you would never know. You wouldn't be able to put them together, right? So if you know anyone who's doing cool cross-border projects, send them to Border Policy Research Institute and put the data up here. Yeah, that's, that's a very good example of a truly cross-border phenomenon with animal migration. Yeah, yeah. Stefan? So it seems like all those, you know, circles and loops we went through, mm -hmm. um, once, you've got, you, once you've arrived at all those decisions, mm -hmm. adding Oregon, where you've got no, you know, similarly the Oregon, Oregon Washington border is pretty They close. will actually match up, yes. And Idaho is not very uh -huh. much editing with the Idaho Canada border. So there's some pretty low hanging fruit. I, I, I do agree with states. that. Yeah, sure. Alaska Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> for the, the projection, the population projection data that we're doing, that is very labor intensive. The data sets are not easily downloadable, so they have to get it census division by census division or county by county. Uh, yeah. So that would be harder to do. But for the basic, just the actual census records themselves, not our derived created data, um, that would not be hard to do at all. We do start creating a bigger data set, and at some point we have to call an end to it. Um, but certainly, yes, could be added to without too much work, yeah. Uh, are there any of the results that surprised you? That's what I've noticed so far. So we're just getting in, to, we're almost done with our own population projections, and I think that's where we're going to find some really interesting things because then we really understand the methodology behind it. I think we'll find uh, neat stuff there. Yeah, you should look through and tell me if anything surprises you. <laughs> Rob? Uh, you use the word aerial. Mm -hmm. Is that different from area? Well, that is about area. Okay. That's affected by area. Where's a grammar person? Um, <laughs> yes, is, yes. Area weighted, aerial weighted interpolation. Yeah. Anything else surprising? Nobody up here. I kind of knew that. Um, <laughs> 855. Yeah. I was surprised about all the re 
the redrawing of the borders that Canada wasn't bothered by having such inconsistent data sets. I guess I'm still in the grumbly phase rather than the being excited <laughs> about the outcomes phase because I'm still <laughs> recovering from like, why do you make it so hard? Um, but I think we'll find some interesting stuff, so stay tuned. Lori. So I'm thinking about um, data that is aggregated at different, completely different units mm -hmm. of the census. Mm -hmm. And sort of what would be the process to, let's just for simplicity's sake say, retail, retail sales tax data at the county level, and then you have a totally different system in Canada. What would be the, the system for taking that kind of data collected on both sides of the border and mm -hmm. incorporating it like this? Well, Tying it into the census units or, or a whole different scale that's comparable? That's yeah. Comparable. So there's two different stories that happen there, right? If it's counties and census divisions and the data easily fit within those. Maybe they're actually collected at smaller scales, but then you can aggregate it within a census division. That's really easy. Then you would just add a, like a, a column, basically, that would show up in your pop-up table here, right? So that just takes some data editing, no big deal. Make a different web map about that. If they are non-overlapping polygons, then it depends on whether you really want it to be comparable or it can just be a separate data set. If you really want it to be comparable, then you're going to have to make a decision about which geographic units you want and use that aerial interpolation and asymmetric mapping. You could even get it, I didn't even say pycnophylactic interpolation. There's like bigger words, <laughs> fancier techniques we could bring in here um, to try to redistribute them. In any case, the smallest scale data you can get and then aggregating to a coarser scale is going to be a better plan. Right? So just only think about things at county scale, and it'll be <laughs> easy. So it'd be somewhat specific to each data set, potentially. It could be, yeah. And so then that makes analysis harder if you want to compare the total number of people with the sales tax data or whatever, right? Um, so it, there's depending on the analysis you want to do, there could be very good reasons to go to all the work of mm -hmm. doing this sort of aerial interpolation, moving the data across, yeah. And I think watersheds, as an ecologist person, are a big one. We always want to know what's going on in watersheds. Census data does not line up tidally with watersheds. But you can use those same interpolation techniques to try to come up with an estimate, not a true count, but an estimate of the people that live in different watersheds or the taxes in different watersheds or <laughs> whatever you're moving across. Yeah. OK. Okay, well, yeah, Rob. I just want to say thanks for explaining those two different ways of arranging heat maps, you know, with the five categories. Oh, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love heat maps and use them all the time. Mm -hmm. and I had never understood that before. Oh, good, yeah. And then we could get into the number of classes. Right. Try to put up to 20 classes instead of five. That's totally different. I'll invite you next time I teach my class <laughs> on that. <laughs> you can come in. Yeah. yeah. No, all these things that have a, a big, big, big impact, and we just treat the maps as truth like it's an objective truth but really it has gone through all these cartographic filters along the way and there's no way to avoid those you could just show a satellite map that's just a photo but beyond that if you're going to do anything like show counts of things or show any sort of colored symbolization on the map you've got to make those decisions and just try to do them honestly and hope that your map audience has taken intro gis the stefan or aquila and then they will know <laughs> to look out for these things <laughs> Okay, okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, keep an ear out. Maybe we could send out a thing when this is actually released. Because I know it's kind of we kind of tantalized you to come in and see this atlas, and then it's actually not out for a few months. So maybe I owe you a link to that eventually. You could go look on the Border Policy Research Institute's website, say in the fall, and it should be up there by then, definitely. I'll tell you what. If you sign up on our list out there and you send me a list, we'll mm -hmm. send it out there. Okay. I promise to do that. Um, in the meantime, there's a lot of Brownies <laughs> left, so that makes up for the draft data, I hope. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.